All right, Tribe, we have a treat for this interview today. First of all, we're at Rick Woodfield. And if you don't know anything about Rick Woodfield, it's one of the most historic ballparks in all of the U.S., really all of the world, because baseball obviously is a U.S. national pastime. And the likes of Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Willie Mays, Satchel Paige, Josh Gibson, and many more have played right here in this stadium, let alone the fact that films like 42, the Jackie Robinson story, or A League of Their Own, and many others have been shot right out here. We're going to end this interview out there, but I'm here with Roy Johnson, and this guy has seen it all when it comes to sports. Been covering sports for, I guess now it's your fourth decade of covering sports. Something like that. So, we, who's it, counting? Yeah, who's yeah, counting? Who's counting? <laughs> and uh, God led him on a very interesting journey to Birmingham, Alabama, of all places. And uh, that's how he and I have been able to meet. He's working for the Alabama media group, AL.com, as a columnist covering a lot of uh, hot topics these days with all that's going on in our country. But what I remember him from is, is Sports Illustrated. And you were at Sports Illustrated, what, 89 to 94? I was at Sports Illustrated actually three different times in my career. I was the magazine's bad penny. They really couldn't <laughs> get rid of me. But I started my career there right out of college uh, in 1978 as a... Uh, really a broom pusher, but it's actually called a fact checker, which is really the lowest position there. But it gave me a great opportunity to work with some great writers and editors. Uh, I was there for five years before I went to the New York Times, later went to the Atlanta Constitution, came back to Sports Illustrated as a senior editor, where I was able to be the editor, golf editor, the uh, NBA editor, the college basketball editor, uh, left again, but then ultimately came back as an assistant managing editor uh, to help sort of guide some of the strategic, new strategic directives in digital media, uh, in film. So I ended up executive producing a couple of uh, national television shows, including the SI Swimsuit Model Search, which was very, very difficult. I'm sorry you had to do yes, that, Roy. Really, I know, somebody had to do it, but I, was, I think I was trained all my life for that. Uh, and also helped create SI.com, so the beginning of the digital era. That's amazing. So we're going to get into your story a little deeper than that, but... The, the way that, that we got reconnected, or I guess connected, we didn't get reconnected, was I picked up my newspaper the Sunday after Muhammad Ali died. And I'm on my front porch here in Birmingham, and I'm reading this article, a phenomenal article, and I wanted to see who wrote it, because he was talking about spending time at Ali's house up in Michigan and debating the Koran and the Bible and Ali doing his act that he always does. And uh, I saw the name Roy Johnson, and my memory triggered seeing you on the Michael Jordan Sports Century back um, in 2000 when Michael Jordan was named the number one athlete by ESPN. Um, and I just started researching you and we connected and, and here we are today. And so what I want to do is I've really had a pleasure getting to know Roy. His story is incredible. And I just want to start um, with, with your childhood. I mean, we're here at a historic ballpark that represents a lot of different things in a city that represents a lot of different things in a time that is very pivotal for our country. And uh, you were born and raised in Tulsa. So just talk about growing up there. And uh, even one of the stories you shared with me that I definitely want you to touch on is the day that um, you, know, uh, you were able to start going to the white side of town. You went to the Piccadilly and conversations with your dad and just what, what it was like growing up in Tulsa with all the one on Black Wall Street, et cetera. Well, so many memories and it's kind of fitting that we're here at Rickwood because I grew up a baseball fan. My dad was a baseball fan and Tulsa was the AAA farm team of the St. Louis Cardinals. So once a year, my dad would take myself and then my younger brother, when he got older, we'd go to St. Louis for the weekend. <laughs> see a weekend series, see a game on Saturday, probably a doubleheader, uh, maybe a game on Sunday and then drive home. So I grew up uh, with the St. Louis Cardinals of, of Bob Gibson, uh, you know, and then Lou Brock, uh, Stan Musial, and it was, it was really the classic Cardinal team, and they were a great Cardinal team, and one of the first teams to not just integrate, but to have multiple African American players, and not just one. Uh, so it was really a good time to, to be a sports fan, to be a young man. Uh, there were obviously some issues, uh, and if you're not familiar with the history of Black Wall Street, uh, between the early part of the 20th century and the middle part of the century, uh, there was an enclave of African-American-owned businesses in Tulsa that was so significant that it was really known around the country as Black Wall Street. Outside of Harlem, it was the largest collection of black-owned businesses in the country. Uh, it, was, it was famous. It was, you know, it was, there were businesses of all kinds, movie theaters, restaurants, anything you can imagine. And it was because of segregation. Whites basically said, you guys stay on the other side of the tracks 
and do whatever you want to do. Build up your own city. And that's exactly what happened. And then later on, uh, in the early 1930s, there was an incident, sort of typical incident, where African-American man bumps into a white woman in an elevator, and of course he's accused of sexual assault, sent to jail, uh, and whites came down to jail because they wanted to lynch him. But the sheriff fortunately said, no, you can't have him. Uh, of course it was fortunate for him, it was unfortunate for the black part of Tulsa because that mob was so incensed that they went through and they burned down most of uh, the black part of town in the great race, one of the biggest race riots in American history. Uh, it came up again recently after the unfortunate incident in Orlando and a lot of the media started calling that nightclub killing the biggest mass murder in American history. And a lot of African Americans were like, wait a minute. You forgot. Well, you forgot about the 1930s race riot. Over 300 African Americans were killed. There were also similar riots uh, in St. Louis and Rosewood. And I don't even call them riots. Rosewood, Florida, right? Rosewood, yeah. Florida. I don't even call them race riots because the blacks were not part of it. They were under attack. More like a massacre. It was a massacre. Well, yeah. it was a massacre. And uh, in Tulsa, it came through, burned it down. By the time I came along in the 50s, a lot of uh, Greenwood, Greenwood Avenue was the name of the street. There was like 125th Street in Harlem, the center of black commerce. It had been rebuilt. My father owned a drugstore there. It was right across the street from a restaurant that has one of my favorite names, Betty's Chat and Chew, at the Rex Movie Theater. Doctors, lawyers, uh, the grocery stores were, were on that same street. So a lot of it had been rebuilt. Uh, and for a long time, people didn't talk about that history. They didn't talk about what happened in the 1930s. Right. And whites and blacks were so embarrassed by it. It was this conspiracy of silence. I didn't learn about it until college. Well, I just want to make a point that uh, I'm just going to be straight up because I can always admit when I don't know something, I didn't know about this until you brought it up to me two weeks ago when we met. Right. right? And you may be watching this and listening to it, or you didn't hear about it. I mean, this is new to a lot of people. Like you said, Orlando did bring it up and educate a lot of people. And a lot of people, when they talk about American history and American history not being taught in the way it should, there's so many aspects of our history that aren't in the history books, that aren't being taught in our classrooms. And as we get through a lot of the, even the re most recent incidents that we've, we've been through in this nation, I think it's important for us to, to be able to put all of our cards on the table so that everybody understands the experiences on both sides and all sides that led us to this place. Uh, you know, having recent conversations with some uh, people in media here who were white and who wanted to know what it was like to be an African American in this country, they were surprised that I had experiences like being pulled over simply because I'm driving a nice car in a neighborhood uh, and, and being or been followed in a, in a mall simply because I look like somebody that might have right. pilfered something. So uh, they were surprised to hear that, that in this day and age that, th that happens and happens every day. So then integration happens in Tulsa and uh, you know, integration was a good thing, but also um, it, it didn't always help black businesses because there wasn't a, a reciprocation necessarily.